move slowly, stop often, listen, look, and always look up because you'll see stuff flying over your head and uh, many of the hawks, falcons, etc. So uh, lots of field guides, I was just trying to count them and there's certainly over 14 field guides for North America and they're all very good. Now today we're doing part two of, of the presentation on, uh, on birds and uh, hopefully you can, uh, I'm just bringing it up now. So here we are. So hopefully everybody can see this. Oh, I'm not sure. Um, did you go to the very bottom of your screen and click the green share screen button? No, I didn't. Okay, no worries. I know Zoom is so complicated you do that? sometimes. <laughs> so if you wiggle your mouse and in the very center of your screen at the bottom is it's green, it says share screen. And another screen uh, well, will pop up. I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of a problem here. Hang on. No worries. Take your time. Ah, the bottom of the screen? Yes, of your Zoom screen um, when you're in your Zoom meeting. Ah, uh, Zoom, okay. Yes. Mute, stop video. Which one are you talking about? It's green and it, it'll say share screen. Share, ah, hit that, yeah, okay. Exactly, perfect. I knew you were the right place. <laughs> okay. And then it'll pop up and you choose which screen you want to share. And if it's not working, I can definitely um, get it for you. Or, oh, oh, there oh, we yeah, are. Got it. Perfect. Good, good, good. Yay. I think we can all agree that Zoom is no one's forte. <laughs> Learning awesome. process. Thank you so much, okay. Kevin. That's great. Hey. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Uh, you are screen sharing. Can I stop this uh, screen share thing? Yes, you can. Um, do you this want to? Get another yeah, one. Yeah. At the very top, you'll see um, there should be like a, a bar at the top yeah. center of your screen, and there'll yeah. be different options, and you can press stop share if you want. Hide thumbnail video. Shows. Um, Try the one on the left. Yeah. Do you? Uh, why do? Would you like to stop share? Oh yeah. You. Do you want to stop sharing or you want to? Oh, no. If you can just uh, let me know what you want to do and I can definitely help. I just you. want to be able to view the, the, the uh, presentation and be heard. Oh. oh, you can't see it? I can see it. OK, can we can all it? see it. Oh, good. Yeah. We're on a I picture of. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, we're still going the wrong way. You know the arrow keys on your computer? You can use those to um, click. Um, huh? If you use the arrow keys on your keyboard, either use it at the very bottom of your keyboard. If you click on the left side arrow going towards the left, you can go back. Yeah. Ah, exactly. marvelous. God Perfect. Thank you Yay. <laughs> Love Thank it. You know. Okay. No worries. Ladies That's what and gentlemen, for. I think we're going to start. So, what we have today are seed eaters, small, Passerine birds that generally eat seeds and they do eat also insects. And uh, coming up here first, of course, is a, a goldfinch. Now, these are rather delightful little birds, about the size of a chickadee. And the male is nice, bright in breeding season, which is generally spring, early summer. Nice golden color with black and white markings on the wing and black skull cap. Female is a duller sort of olive green, and uh, you can see a female on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, uh, it is worth pointing out that while we're looking at birds, we should try and remember 
Many of the field guides use the terms on the left, the topography of a bird, and you see crown, which is pretty, so eye ring. But there are some of those that the scapulars, secondaries, some of those uh, names you're going to have to learn or eventually learn. I always find that uh, bird books aren't a bad thing to keep in the smallest room in the house, and you can browse them at your leisure. Um, so goldfinches are really well worth watching for. Generally, in the lower mainland, they uh, they winter here in small numbers, but they're really a a spring, summer, and fall bird with us. And if you're feeding birds, they will come to feeders. Unfortunately, they will get that horrible disease that many of the small birds get if the feeders aren't kept clean. In the winter, we get large numbers of these little birds called pine siskins. Now, these are these are little birds that come out of the northern forests uh, in fall, and they can be flocks of a thousand or 50 and they come south and they eat seed out of different trees, out of cones of different conifers and also alders, red alders and uh, birch seed and that's what they really like and they, uh, as I say, they fly in large flocks, they tweeter and uh, quite often, a large flock of uh, 500 or so might have a, a hawk or a falcon with them. Uh, it may have a sharp shinned hawk or a merlin or a cooper's hawk following them. Amongst the uh, large flocks of siskins in the lower mainland, we can get uh, red poles. Uh, they are about the same size as the siskins and behave much the same way, uh, eating the seed of uh, alders, birch, and conifers. But they'll be mixed in sometimes with the siskins, and of course they have this rather nice red cap and uh, white brown markings. Then they're, they're not common. So it's quite something to see if you are one or two in a flock of siskins. Very common birds with us uh, in the winter are the juncos. There are actually uh, four different varieties of junco. The one on the top left here is the Oregon or dark-eyed junco. And the one to the right is the uh, eastern variety, is, a, is another variety of the dark-eyed junco called the pink-sided. We get both. Bottom right is the slate colored junco, which is the eastern variety. And these are all actually the same species, the dark eyed or Oregon, the pink sided or slate colored. The one on the lower left is a different species, the gray headed, and it's found in uh, western, in one area down in the western mountains, the Rocky Mountains. The, uh, so the, the juncos generally are loose, found in loose flocks. And of course, they eat seed. It should be said that all of these small birds in the breeding season when nesting feed their young on insects, not seeds. So they eat a lot of insects in the summer, spring, summer, and fall, actually. In the spring and summer and fall, we get birds coming to us from the south, birds that have wintered in Mexico, like the grosbeaks. On the left-hand side is the black-headed grosbeak. Uh, top is the female, bottom left the male. These birds eat uh, a lot of insects, but they also eat uh, kernels out of or seeds out of cherries and other bearing, bearing shrubs and uh, trees, they especially like the uh, European cherry, uh, and uh, they, they crack open the uh, the kernel of seeds and eat the actual uh, nut inside. You can see the map at the top left. This gives you an idea of where the birds, the orange is where they summer and breed, and the blue and purple is where they spend the winter. So they like to go to Mexico for the winter. The top right is the rose-breasted grosbeak, which is the eastern counterpart of the black-headed, different species. But where their ranges overlap, 
and that's what the map in the center shows, where those ranges, breeding ranges overlap, they will hybridize. And if you live in those areas, you can see hybrids between the black-headed and the rose-breasted. And that is quite, uh, sometimes can present a bit, of a bit of a challenge, especially if you're not aware of it and you're a new bird watcher. So uh, you can see there in South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa, there's an overlap area. And uh, yeah, it's sort of interesting. Another gross speak that we get coming out of the north, and you can see the permanent residence top left, the map. The green range there is the uh, sort of pinky purple area. The blue area is where they spend the winter. And these are eruptive species that turn up some years in very large numbers. And you can see the massive beak on these cross beaks. These are just slightly smaller than a, a robin. And the males are a nice golden yellow, black and white. Females are just a sort of duller gray, gray and still black and white. These really do like the uh, seeds out of berries and they are seed predators. And even in the summertime, they will uh, fly into cherry orchards and uh, decimate the cherry crop because they like to get the uh, seed uh, out of the middle of the cherry. They're not interested so much in the pulp, the uh, part we eat, but they're interested in the actual nut in the middle of the seed. And those beaks can crack that open. They uh, don't mind eating European or cultivated cherries. So there we are, cherries are very important. Uh, there are other species that love, uh, these birds will also eat the uh, cherry laurel. Uh, it's a evergreen uh, exotic that's not uncommon on the west coast. And the, the, they have uh, cherries in the uh, late summer, August. And again, the uh, gross beaks will devour those seeds. They're living also in these thickets of cherry laurels and other thickets. Uh, are the birds at the very bottom, on the bottom right is a fox sparrow. Uh, bottom left is a spotted towie. And in, in the center there is, bottom center is a song sparrow. So uh, moving along to look at some other species, we're moving now more to the thrush family. And up top left is a uh, Swainson's thrush, which is a summer visitor, slightly smaller than a robin. On the right, of course, are robins, a family of robins. You all hopefully know what a robin looks like. Here we have mom and dad uh, feeding young. And bottom left is a western tanager at its nest, a male western tanager. Now, tanagers come to us from Mexico and Central America for the summer, and uh, they like older, second growth, 70 plus year old dug fir, maple forests, uh, This is a pair of pine grosbeaks. Not that common a bird, uh, unless you're, you live at higher elevations or in the interior, in the interior of BC and probably interior of Washington uh, and Oregon in the winter, they will come down from the higher mountain top, the mountain forests, and they, uh, they love to eat the seeds out of again, out of berries, especially Pacific crab apple. The male is the bird on the left and the female on the right. And you can see that the male has been uh, working at, at the crab apples. They basically just uh, crush the, uh, the seeds and eat their kernels from inside. They are slightly smaller than a robin. And we've had a few of them around Maplewood Conservation Area this winter. Uh, you can see the bird on the right is a male, and on the left is an illustration by Fenwick Benznan of a male at the top, a female on the left, and a young male at the bottom. It takes the males a, a year to get the full plumage. 
They don't turn up in great numbers every year, but in the lower mainland, there's generally somewhere you can go to see them each winter. And it may only be a dozen or three or four. So looking now carefully at these finches uh, on the left, these are purple finches and they are residents on the west coast. They like uh, to eat again the seeds out of berries, especially Pacific crab apples. The female is the top left. Busy uh, the photograph here shows the female eating seeds. The center top is the male, which is a nice red color, especially on the back. That's how you can really pick out the purple finch from house finches. It has this nice red back, the male, and the female, just below, depicted below the male there, has a nice strong white eye stripe. So the bottom left is the male the photograph, and on the right are house finches, a pair of house finches. And you see they have their backs to us, and the male on the left does not have a red back. It has a gray brown back, and there's no eye stripe on the female. So these house finches are quite an interesting story. The uh, bird, this is, I think you can read here, the, uh, the sort of typical male is the uh, bird at the top right. Then you have a male that has a somewhat yellow variant, and then the female, unfortunately, is very dull colored. I should just say that generally with birds, the females are dull colored because they have to sit on the nest and blend in. They have to be camouflaged. So they generally are not as uh, brightly colored as the males. Males are brightly colored because they generally hold the territory. They want to be seen by their uh, competing males and they sing from perches. So, yeah. So the house finches, as I was saying, have a sort of interesting little uh, history. This, um, you can see in the top left, uh, this pair of house finches has built their nest uh, on the side of a house above a lamp. And this is something that house finches are quite happy to live in suburbia. The map shows where they are found. And you can see that they are definitely found just about throughout the continental uh, United States. Uh, especially uh, the western part and then the eastern part. And they are in fact found now as far north in the summer as Prince George. So they really spread. And indeed they originally started back in the 1940s, which was in the map here, but look at the top left. There's a map and it shows where house finches were found 1958 through 61, and you can see they're very definitely Western. In fact, they originally started in uh, Mexico, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California. And with uh, the spread of suburbia, they have moved north. And the removal of old growth forests, they really, uh, and opening up of agricultural land, they moved north. And you can see the bottom left, uh, by 1968, 71, they were beginning to appear in eastern North America, around New York. And what happened there was they were very popular cage birds in the, uh, before the 1940s. And in 1940s, just after the war, it was made illegal to keep wild birds in cages. So a lot of dealers in small birds, songbirds, cage birds, they released their uh, house finches on Long Island in, uh, in the 50s, in the early, late 40s and early 50s. And in fact, the, so many were released, they made themselves at home and they started to spread in Eastern North America. And uh, you can see by uh, seven, not top right in 1978, 81, they were really getting well established. And uh, by the 1990s, on the right, lower right, they were well established in Eastern North America. They crossed the Mississippi and were get, hitting the Great Plains. Uh, this, what this map doesn't show, unfortunately, is the spread north into British Columbia and up to Prince George. They're now found well up to Prince George 
in the summer. So a very successful bird, uh, one, probably popular with people because they have a nice little song, the males have a nice red breast, and they nest around suburban homes, and they're visible, and uh, so people quite like them. These are house sparrows, European or Eurasian house sparrows, and they, of course, came to North America, were introduced to try and control insects around farmyards, and of course, they loved it, and they have made themselves at home, especially uh, when we had old, messy farmyards and lots of horses. The bird on the right is uh, a male, and he's uh, around a fast food outlet or a cafe, outdoor cafe. And this is how house sparrows have made their living. In fact, they're probably one of the birds that have been with us longest, probably since we first started farming. 5,000 plus years ago in the Middle East. Now we do have a lot of native sparrows. Uh, the uh, Eurasian house sparrow is the only one that's introduced, but we have a lot of native sparrows. And the, this is the uh, fox sparrow. It's all one species, but in different parts of its geographic range, it has slightly different plumages. And you can see that the uh, lineup on the left goes from what they call the sooty uh, right up um, to the uh, one on the top. So they, they have this, and even the peaks are bigger or smaller. Uh, so on the west coast here, we tend to have the one on the bottom left, which is the sooty. But back east, the one on the right is uh, the one that's generally seen. So again, here is the, uh, on the left is the west coast fox sparrow. Notice the lower mandible of the lower part of the beak is yellow. Nice smooth markings on the head and back. Whereas the eastern fox sparrow, if you're Ontario or the Maritimes, on the right hand side, quite a different looking bird, really. Yet the same species, just a different subspecies. Here we are with the fox sparrow with its lower mandible yellow and a nice smooth head subspecies we get on the west coast in the winter. They come out of the mountains, uh, they nest up on the subalpine and come down uh, for the winter to spend the winter in thickets, shrub thickets, so uh, blackberry being very popular with them, where they eat a lot of blackberry seeds and uh, of course in thick blackberries uh, cover, you have all sort of uh, leaf litter underneath where they can scrape and get insect eggs and spider eggs and so forth. There they're joined by the song sparrows. Notice the bird on the right is the western subspecies, but both the eastern on the left and the western on the right have very streaked heads and no color in the beak. And they're slightly smaller than fox sparrows, but these are very common birds and very successful. You go down back alleys down in Vancouver, there's a blackberry thicket, thicket of shrubs, uh, you'll probably find a song sparrow in that thicket. We do have other number of other sparrow species. And unfortunately with sparrows, they are the typical little brown birds. So how do you sort of separate them? These are all slightly smaller than a European house sparrow or junco, but not much. So the bird on the extreme left is a savannah sparrow. If you look at its eye, just above the eye, there's a slight touch of yellow. And that is a good field mark to look for for savannah sparrows. Quite often the yellow is more pronounced than that. The bird in the center is a Lincoln sparrow, named after Mr. Lincoln. And it's, uh, you can see, has a gray and brown, a gray head with stripes. And in the middle of its chest is a little dark spot. And that is the way you can really pick out the Lincolns. The bird on the top right is a Vesper sparrow. It's not that common here, uh, maybe on migration. And then the bird on the bottom right is a swamp sparrow. And a few of these turn up every winter in marshy areas, areas with weed beds. And it's worth uh, just checking out. 
quite a small sparrow. Now, white crown sparrows are another success story from the bird world. Um, they have fallen in love with the landscaping around shopping centers, government buildings, office blocks. If you go to downtown Vancouver, on top of the uh, courthouses where there are gardens, landscape garden areas, you'll find uh, white crown sparrows nesting and singing in the summer. They are quite obvious. They're not, they're not a shy bird. Uh, they sit in the bushes and you get a good view of them. Nice black and white striped crown. There are three subspecies you can see here illustrated. Uh, and the, uh, they, uh, in their natural nesting areas, they like open shrubby areas, grassy, marshy areas with shrubs or the top of mountains of the tree line. And uh, yes, they're worth, well worth the looking for around shopping centers and landscape areas. The uh, immatures, of course, do not like, do not look like the, the adults. And in winter, they look just very much duller. And on the lower right is a good example of a winter uh, white crown. On the top left are golden crown sparrows. Now these turn up in the winter and uh, they too are, uh, you can see the winter adult is at the, the top left and on the right hand side, a duller version of the uh, breeding plumage. Golden crowns and white crowns often hang out together and sometimes in the uh, winter you'll get a white throated sparrow, the bird on the lower left, in the flocks of white crowned and golden crowned sparrows. Again, they love the blackberry thickets, uh, generally eating the, the seeds of the blackberries. You can see here the golden crowned sparrows nest uh, in the mountains of central and northern British Columbia into Yukon and Alaska. And the blue areas where they winter well, they go quite a distance south in the winter. Very definitely a western bird. Another western species that we is quite common in uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia, southwestern BC, is the spotted tully. Again, a seed eater. And when I say that, of course, in the summer, they will eat insects and feed their young insects. Now, this is one of the things about small passerine birds, songbirds, they feed their young a lot of insects. And they are certainly one of the controls on the insect population. Here they are in left and right eating uh, berries and they go after the seeds again, not so much the pulp. So they're seed predators and uh, they uh, come into British Columbia, just into the lower mainland, Sunshine Coast, east coast of Vancouver Island, and parts of the west coast. They don't like cold, snowy winters, and they're not that happy in the rain. So quite often, if we get a lot of rain, they, uh, they look pretty miserable sometimes. They're really a, a California bird that's come north. I'm going to look now at some of the wobbler species, which are insect eating birds and most of the wobblers come here for the summer to eat our insect populations and here we have wobblers that are black and white the uh, bird at the top left is is in fact called a black and white wobbler and it behaves a, a bit like a woodpecker it can actually go underneath branches as the picture shows here and it's actually an eastern wobbler and northern wobbler that enters British Columbia from the northeast of BC. But we get the odd one turning up on the west coast. And certainly, uh, you know, if you see a black and white wobbler crawling around underneath a tree branch, chances are it is a black and white wobbler. The bird on the top right is a black pole wobbler found in central northern BC and then into across the boreal forest in there. Eastern North America. Blackpole is rare on the West Coast, but worth watching for. 
The birds on the bottom, bottom right is a female black pole wobbler. And again, with wobblers, the females are often just a duller, a very dull version or differently marked two males. And of course, the trouble with wobblers is in, from August into winter, they lose the distinctive plumage, breeding plumage. So it's really worthwhile getting hold of a book, a field guide on wobblers, so you can familiarize yourself with them. Bottom left and center left, lower left, are the black throated gray wobbler. Uh, this is the one that is commonest here. Uh, it's certainly one that can be seen at the middle of the conservation area in spring and summer. And again, you can see that the, uh, the male is uh, got this little yellow dot between the beak and the eye and does have a nice, uh, nicely marked head and nice gray back. So this is one of the cases where black-throated gray is a good name for this bird. These birds are all about the size of chickadees. They often are in the flock with chickadees in the late summer and uh, worth checking out. There's a good field guide put out, the uh, Peterson Field Guide series on wobblers. This is the cover of the one I own. The cover may have changed. Uh, this, um, I think there's probably an app as well. Most of these things now are found on apps. So this covers the wobblers of North America. And uh, for example, I'm just taking one, the yellow rumped wobbler. The top right shows the two subspecies of yellow wobbler. Uh, one is the Audubon's and the other one's the uh, myrtle. The myrtle is more northern and eastern. The Audubon's is definitely western. And in British Columbia, they actually meet just north of Prince George, the two ranges, and you get hybrids. So a bit of an interesting thing for anybody living where the overlap zone occurs, you get intermediates where they hybridize. This is actually uh, not uncommon in birds. And in some cases, uh, the genetic, genetics people have uh, decided that these are still full species. And in others, as with the yellow rump water, they decided that they are simply subspecies of the same species. So at one time, uh, bird watchers could say, I've seen myrtle water and I've seen Audubon's water and the two different species. But today, according to the American Ornithological Union, they're the same species, so you can only count one instead of two on their list. The, uh, but this uh, field guide to wobblers uh, it really does help uh, sort all this out for you. And uh, of course, with all of these birds, the songs are important. And again, I would suggest you go to Cornell University, uh, Google them, and they, they have just an amazing, they, they have all the songs there. And you can um, familiarize yourself with those. I generally have to do it every spring because uh, the uh, birds sing, of course, in the spring. And then by the time the next spring comes, you've sort of forgotten something. Uh, so it's worth familiarizing yourself there. Both Audubon and uh, Cornell University and the Audubon Society have this, and I think there are many others on the great Google site. Many field guides point out uh, what to look for. This is uh, from the Peterson Field Guide, and you can see that, as I was talking about earlier, with songbirds and the quite a number of other species, it's worth checking out the uh, the eye stripes and the crown stripes, eye rings, wing bars, and of course wing patterns. Here they're using ducks to uh, show you the different wing patterns and that can get you. So with bird watching, it's, <laughs> yes, the color of the bird is important, but a lot of other things are important too. It's worth remembering the other things to look for. Here is a, pair, a, a black turnstone, the top, a shorebird called a black turnstone, and the bottom is a surf bird, another 
uh, shorebird. And these birds are found around rocky shores on the west coast. And you can see they have very different uh, wing patterns and uh, their tail patterns are different. So very distinctive. We will be returning to shorebirds later in another presentation. The shape of a bird is exceptionally important. Uh, top left is uh, a starling and uh, obviously very different shape to a cuckoo on the right. And again, uh, what, uh, what shape of the wings, how's the fly? You can see there's a quail on the left and a swallow. So the shape and the tail, the wings, etc., very important. The uh, top right, the shape of the tail. And again, you can see the very different shapes of tails there. Everything from barn swallows through morning doves. And how does the bird behave? In other words, is it like a wren with the tail up or uh, like a flycatcher with it down? So there are many different behavior of a bird. And does it climb in trees like woodpeckers, brown creepers, nut hatches, black and white wobblers? And of course, what shape is the beak, lower left, or the bill? And that is a very important thing too. All these things. How does it fly? Is it hovering? Does it sort of fly in loops? Direct flight, fast flight, slow wing beats. If it's swimming, how does it swim? Is it uh, semi submerged? Does it sit high on the water? Does it dive? If it's wading, how does it wade? Does it have very long legs, long beaks? Uh, and of course, the field markings, this is getting into plumage, uh, top right. Is it like a thrush, a thrasher, a cuckoo? I just point out that cuckoos are rare birds, um, just about on the west coast. Uh, we don't really have any left in BC. They're one of the birds that is extirpated or gone extinct in British Columbia. The tail pattern, again, uh, Black, white, white outer, you know, white outer tail feathers, white on the end of the feathers, the shape of the tail, the rump patches, uh, there's a white rump, hard rump. These are things that are all very good to look for. I'm going to have a look at uh, some of the hawks just to uh, finish off. And this is a field guide again from Peterson Field Guides, and it looks at all the Sipiters and falcons and hawks. There are main families of hawks in North America. Now let's just take those in some sort of order. The top on the left hand side, the uh, buteos, large uh, hawks, uh, not half the size of an eagle. Uh, Buteos are uh, the, the birds you see sitting uh, by the highways, soaring overhead, often depicted in uh, Western movies. Uh, they have a sort of a cry a bit like a cat. And the uh, buteos are, uh, can be difficult to identify. But here on the West Coast in southwestern BC, we're lucky in that we have generally got one very common species, the red tailed hawk. And in the winter, we have a rough leg hawk, which comes out of the high Arctic. And the rest of the time, really, uh, we have uh, a few that migrate through, but aren't that common. Then we have the accipiters. These are small, uh, actually not, there's a, three of them. The goshawk, which is quite large, crow-sized, bigger. Uh, the cooper's hawk, about the size of a crow, and then the sharp shinned hawk, which is sort of robin sized and slightly bigger. And uh, they are long tailed, uh, short winged and very fast flying. Generally, the coopers and the goss are the ones that soar, the sharp shin doesn't. And the top right, we have harriers. Now, in North America, we have one species of harrier called the northern harrier. And uh, harriers are really a Eurasian family. 
about half a dozen species and more in Eurasia. Well, here in North America, we have the Northern Harrier. They hunt over marshes, grasslands, fields for small mammals and birds. We have a few breed in the Lower Mainland, but they generally come out to us for the winter and go to Richmond Delta, you see them there. Well, Richmond, not so much now. Most of the uh, habitat they've been built on, but go out in the Delta area, there's still habitat and up the valley. Then there are kites, and these we don't have in D.C., but in Washington State, they come into Washington State and, of course, Oregon, California. And then we have falcons, or white falcons, very fast flying, pointed wings, not rounded like the occipiters. So again, the whole shape of the bird is very worthwhile looking at the wings, the tail. So here we have the acceptors, the two. One on the left is the Cooper's hawk. About the size of a crow, the female is slightly bigger than a crow, the male is slightly smaller. They will hunt crows. And on the right is the uh, sharp shinned hawk. The female, uh, somewhat bigger than a robin, uh, male is the same size as a robin. With uh, birds of prey, the males are always smaller than the females. I think the note here is the end of the tail, uh, not the plumage. You can see that color-wise, the plumage is in these adults is virtually the same. So the thing to look at is the end of the tail. The Cooper's hawk has a baseball bat-shaped tail. It's rounded. The sharp shin has a squared off or slightly notched tail. Another thing to look at is the head. The sharp shin the hawk's head is small and seems to be hunched and buried in the body, whereas the Cooper's hawk has a large head sticking right out of the body. And of course, uh, in flight, this is the silhouette, which is the thing you should really try and familiar yourself with familiarize yourself with because uh, generally you don't get a really good view of these birds. They're hunting, they're flying fast. So you can see the sharp shin, squared notch tail. Uh, the uh, wrists of the wing are right forward and uh, the head barely extends beyond the uh, wrists. Uh, if you go to the left, you can see that the Coopers is quite different. Now, however, having said this, uh, myself and my bird watching buddies have uh, come across birds which we have not been able to identify on a few occasions. And we, four of us there, and uh, one of us has said, oh, that's a Cooper's hawk, uh, I think. And somebody else has said, no, I think it might be a sharp shin. And uh, in a few occasions, we've really given up. So it's interesting that we, can, we can't always identify it. This uh, photograph shows a uh, Cooper's hawk being attacked by a sharp shinned. Sharp shinned is above and is the smaller, and the Cooper's is the larger flying on its back, <laughs> trying to defend itself. Yes. They're both adults. So here we have the uh, Cooper's. Now the bird in the middle is an immature. And you can see it's totally different. Its plumage is totally different from the adult, the adult Cooper's hawk, top right. And what we're looking at is uh, three immature Cooper's hawks, but the tail is still rounded like a bat, a bat, baseball bat. The head sticks well out ahead of the wings. It's fairly large headed. And uh, this is our commonest accipiter in the lower mainland of British Columbia. And indeed, it nests in this area. <coughs> they generally nest in old crow's nests. And uh, they will, as I was saying, even attack and kill crows. So uh, that is the Cooper's hawk. Now, we're going to look at the sharp shin versus the Cooper's. And on the left is a sharp shin immature. Again, note the plumage is quite different to the adult's plumage. Uh, note the notched or squared tail and the smaller head. And then when you do look at the heads, if you're lucky and get a really good view of the heads of birds, you can see they are actually different. 
slightly different coloration of the plumage and uh, eye ring. Uh, on the top right is an immature Cooper's hawk, which you can compare it with the sharp shin on the left, top left, top right. Top right is the Cooper's. Now, in the middle is an artist's impression of a sharp shin. And this could be difficult. Note that the tail is fanned, so you don't know if it's notched or rounded. And it's an immature. So, uh, yeah. Can't always be sure. The size is a big thing, though. And that's worth remembering. Uh, top on the left here, we have a Cooper's attacking a, a red tail top. And then on the right, we have a, a sharp shin. Sorry, these are both sharp shin. Sharp shin attacking, uh, trying to get a junko for dinner. So you can see the uh, trouble is with sharp shins, they hunt low and fast through the forest. So you really only get a glimpse. And generally, they are a bird in the lower mainland of fall, winter, and spring. And they don't hang around here for the summer too much. So here are some silhouettes that gives you an idea of size. You can see the crow on the left. Then you can see a female Cooper's hawk and a male Cooper's hawk in the middle. And then a female sharp shin. Now, actually, the female sharp shin is almost as big as the Cooper's. Uh, I think this is a slightly, they could have made this uh, sharp shin slightly bigger. And the male uh, sharp shin is robin sized so it's a small hawk and you can see the silhouette the rounded tail of the coopers squared or slightly notched tail of the sharp shin and the head of the sharp shin sort of tucked in uh, and small compared to the coopers the large occipiter hawk that we get in the winter time is the goshawk and this is certainly a stunning bird to see. Luckily, they will sit out on the branches of trees. They've got a good spotting scope or a good pair of binoculars. You get a nice view of these. This is the adult male or female. It's caught a northern flicker. And the one on the right is going after a, a snowshoe hare. They will eat mammals and birds. And they're fairly powerful hunters. They'll take skunks. They've got no sense of smell. Small raccoons. Here we have a uh, immature goshawk on the left being pursued by a Merlin falcon, a much smaller predatory bird called falcon. And on the right is a look at the uh, uh, this is from a European book, but it looks at peregrine falcons and the shapes of occipiter hawks on the lower left and Merlin. You can see the falcons are shorter tailed, very sharp winged compared to the occipiter on the lower left. And then there's a European cuckoo there, which is quite hawk like. Anyway, that is a good idea of how they. Uh, when you're glimpsing something flying across, check its wing shape. Is it sharp wing, rounded wing, tail? Is it very long? Is it medium? So you've got to check that as well, the plumage as well. With falcons, they quite often, the peregrines have these uh, mustaches, sort of eye, eye markings on the eye. So we're going to look next time at uh, at the falcons uh, further, this just gives you an idea of the uh, of the goshawks. You can see the uh, bird on the left. Bird center top is goshawk, uh, number ten and eleven. The adult male is number, the adult is ten, and the eleven is uh, immature. Then beneath that, we have a, a couple of falcons. We have number uh, six, 16, I believe, is a Jura falcon. And then number 14 is a prairie falcon, which occurs in the interior, we see. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, illustrations of uh, peregrine at the top, goshawks on the right, 
uh, and then the lower left we have very uh, sharp shinned hawks close to the trunk of the tree and then a merlin on the lower left. So we'll be coming to all of those again in uh, part three of this uh, presentation, which I believe might be next week. Anyway, uh, is it next week or four, three weeks from now? It might be three weeks from now. I have to check. Uh, I, I think Leanne might know that. I'm pretty sure it's three weeks. It's I think it's three weeks. Yes. yes. Nicole, that's it. Three weeks. Yes. <laughs> there you are. Yes. Sweet. I think. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, any we'll any definitely... chat? Yes. Anybody okay. To... So I will look in the chat. Um, thank you so much, first of all, Kevin. I really appreciate no this awesome presentation. Um, everyone, if you either want to unmute yourselves, and again, to unmute yourself, you can just go on the lower left-hand side of your computer screen um, with Zoom open. And if you shake your mouse a little bit, you'll see it says unmute. Uh, so you can either unmute yourself or you can write in the chat. So if you have a question, you can either say it out loud or you can write in the chat and we'd love to spend maybe just about five minutes answering questions and then, um, yeah, but that was a really awesome presentation, Kevin. Thank you so much. Not at all. Nice. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I had no idea about the hawks and all the sizes and I loved seeing the smaller hawks going after the big ones. That was so yes, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, actually, the smallest two, the shark shin and the Merlin falcon, are really feisty. In fact, Merlin falcon is, I think it's, it's really, a, it's amazing. It'll attack, it'll attack eels, and it'll attack uh, any other hawk, falcon. Oh. Just amazing. And they're only, as, as I say, they're probably the size of a robin. Wow. Slightly bigger. So really feisty. That's amazing. Um, so uh, thank you, Leanne. Marie said, um, Maria asked earlier, what is the easy field mark to distinguish the white crowned sparrow? Uh, well, the white crowned is the best in the breeding season. And uh, they definitely do have white striped crowns. Um, let's see if I can I... find, now in the winter, they're just a duller version really of the uh, the white crown is quite faded. And if I can just find, just trying to find the- uh... Yeah, no worries. Maurice, I think she's unmuted herself. So if you wanna- Yes, I meant between the different type of white crown, um, between oh, the, the subspecies and the, the other type of white crown. Ah, and right. Let's just see if I can bring that up here. Good question, It makes Marie. life a lot easier when you have something to look at. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. There we go. Let's uh, bring this up. So here you have the three subspecies, the one on the right, and then the one center and the left, top left. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, it's not easy to pick out these subspecies, but generally, if you look at the top left, you see the plumage is quite gray underneath right around the chest and the side of the head up to the eye and it extends around the back of the neck so that uh, gamble is that way the natalia is uh, got a white more white throat and it has a uh, sort of a beige chest beige brown and uh, then on the right hand side you can see we have the other subspecies there which i'm not going to try and pronounce the name <laughs> uh, it has a white throat and again it has the gray but its beak is not quite as yellow and its back has more gray in it than brown so if you look at the back of the other two on the top left the one on the lower right has more gray brown so yes, they're not easy to pick out in the field, uh, but some of the field guides actually do give you a fairly good help on that. I'm just looking in the Sibley's, uh, which is the one I have handy. The other field guides, I think uh, Peterson's field guide actually does a good job, but I don't have it sitting right beside me at the moment. 
maybe I should have had. <laughs> the, uh, the thing about field guides, as Roger Tory Peterson once said, is to remember that they are a guide. So unfortunately with birds, like everything in the natural world, there's variation. Uh, you know, generally there's a rule. This is what a white crown sparrow looks like, but, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it can be partly albino. Uh, sometimes it will just have slight variation. Yes, if you uh, check the, uh, just check, yeah, if you check the uh, Sibleys, they, they talk about the, uh, the different subspecies there. And again, it's fairly well illustrated. Wonderful. But it's not easy to pick them out on the field. So we wouldn't, wouldn't panic. Them. No, okay. I gotta go like this. Thank you. Hey. Awesome. Anybody else? Um, I think I saw one more question up here. Oh, thank you from Scotland, Maggie. That is awesome. Uh, before I say any questions, I just want to let everyone know I will be sending out a like a follow up email uh, shortly after, either a little bit later today or tomorrow. And with it, you'll have the link to our Eventbrite, um, and I'll hopefully try to also put a link to Kevin's next talk because um, uh, I know many of you are like super excited. So I love that. That's awesome. So just to let you know, it will be in the follow-up email. You can also follow us if you have social media on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So those are also great ways to learn about upcoming events. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that before. On um, the left there, I don't, can they see this? Uh... Yeah, I can still see your screen. Yeah. So on the left are just a few of the field guides that are available. Uh, there's the uh, Peterson field guides, the Sibley field guides, and uh, they are all excellent. There are many others, as I was saying earlier, that I counted up to 14 different field guides from North America. So there's, uh, <laughs> you go into a bookstore, you're going to find a field guide to birds. For locally, which I think a lot of people like, is something just specifically for the lower mainland area. Uh, there's a very good little pocket field guide put out by, uh, written by Dick Cannings, who is a leading ornithologist in BC, and it's called Birds of Southwestern British Columbia. Nice. Yes, I own that book actually. Ah, <laughs> there you book. are. Yeah. Um, one person, Samantha Taylor, asked, "What are your tricks for distinguishing female house finches from sparrows when you can't see all the details?" That is a good question. Uh, this is this is a, really the way they behave. Uh, sparrows. How am I going to put this? Okay, house finches definitely are birds that will sit up on the top of shrubs, and the females uh, and the males generally are together. Uh, they have nice little song, uh, which the uh, sparrows in the winter don't tend to do. And I'm just trying to find. Okay, so here we have the uh, house finch. And you can see the female is uh, very sparrow-like, but more uh, upright perch, like more straight up and down when they perch, mm, yeah. not sort of horizontal. I, I, sparrows quite often horizontal. The female sparrows, like the song sparrow, fox sparrow, uh, which you're allowed to mix these, and the other uh, savanna, they, uh, the song fox are generally on the ground, and when they get disturbed, they go into the shrubs. They disappear. House finches will fly up and perch higher up in the tree, and quite often they'll twitter. The uh, other thing about a female house finch uh, apart from having a male usually close by, uh, they are how do I, they are they are definitely uh, in small groups. Quite often you'll find half a dozen together, four together, maybe more than that, maybe a dozen. So that's worth remembering. And uh, yep, there you go. Nice. Oh, I also really... bird you might see around suburbia a lot more than uh, say uh, white crown or well, white crown and uh, golden crown in the wintertime, but generally out in farmland. But anyway, 
Um, no, that's awesome. Kevin, you are such a wealth of knowledge. It's awesome yeah. to uh, listen to you. And, you know, like I'm always so captivated all, always. Um, and I just want to thank you, Kevin, so much for, for hosting and for sharing th your knowledge with us. And oh, I want to thank everyone for um, attending and listening. And it means so much to, uh, to us and exactly those on Facebook as well. And if anyone has any suggestions for future events that they want to see, whether it might be a particular particular bird or something else definitely either let us know down in the chat or uh thank you so much marie or definitely let us know on uh, social media or by email again i'll be sending that follow-up uh email in a few days and it'll have you know links to everything but you can also send us an email to at communications at wildbirdtrust.org um, and we'll definitely try to uh, answer that so yeah i just want to say a huge thank you i mean i I could go on and talk forever about this, but um, I definitely am wary that, you know, we're um, at 12. So I'll let everyone, you know, have a good day. And yeah, just thanks again. So thank you, Kevin. And thank you. Thank you we'll to everyone. You yeah. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Night, night. And um, oh, Leanne said, we are keen to return to safely distance walks on site. And there's a Coast Salish Family Day. Yes, so our Coast Salish Family Day event is uh, 11 a.m. Uh, to 2, 2 p.m. on Monday, February 15th. And Kevin will be speaking then. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely tune in. Again, that will be on our uh, Eventbrite and in the follow-up email as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, and yeah, just a huge thank you to everyone. So have a good day. Bye. Bye.